All right. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and I um, hope you can, can hear me on your end. Um, welcome to the beef uh, seasonal update for spring 2021. Uh, my name's Matt Lischke. I'm an, an ag advisor with Local Land Services uh, based out of the Goulburn office. And um, today, our, our presentation or our webinar will, will feature three separate talks. Um, I'll begin by looking at current, um, current soil moisture conditions, um, what the bomb is saying, and also what this means in terms of spring pasture production uh, and what grazing management strategies you might employ to maximise livestock performance this spring. I'll then pass over to Jeff House. Um, Jeff, Jeff will then discuss some of the marketing options available to beef producers, uh, including an insight into what the feedlots and processes are doing as well. And then to finish off, um, our district vet from Yas, Alex Stevens. Alex will provide an animal health update. So Alex will, will, will look back a little bit at what are some of the, the issues that have been um, really prominent in the last couple of months, but also looking ahead and, um, and going through what are some of the things to watch out for um, this spring. So hopefully we'll be able to get through those, those three areas in, in an hour. That's what we're aiming for, to get through that by two o'clock. And then we've allocated um, some question time at the end. So, um, yeah, please, please feel free to ask questions at the end um, and, and to send them through. So just on that, before we, before we launch into things, um, just a little bit of housekeeping. On your right-hand side of your screen, um, hopefully you'll see a control panel, which looks like this. Um, to expand and collapse the control panel, you can click on that little um, orange arrow at the top top corner there. To um, so also just so you're aware, this this webinar is being recorded, and um, to I, to we've actually muted um, everyone just to help with with any sort of interference or, or feedback or echoes. Um, so that's why you'll see that that little um, microphone button in red, which means that you're muted. So you won't be able to talk, but if you would like to um, submit a question um, or a comment, there is a little field in, um, or a space for you to do that. And so, um, yeah, please, please feel free to ask questions um, or, or provide comments. Um, we will address those questions one by one at the end of the webinar during that question time. Um, and when you put put your question in, if you can please just specify where you are, where you're located, um, because we just have, um, I guess, producers from all parts of the southeast, you know, ranging from from tablelands through the coast. So we'll just really help us in being able to answer your questions, if you can just let us know uh, where you're coming from. All right, so just to provide an overview on, on seasonal conditions, um, yeah, this year we experienced what you might call a very uh, traditional uh, winter, wasn't it? It was quite, quite wet um, and cold, and a lot of overcast days and, and periods where we didn't see a lot of sun and that that was that proved to be quite challenging, um, not just for pasture growth, but also for livestock um, as well. They, they certainly didn't like it much, and and that then meant a, a number of animal health issues um, popped up. And Alex will will talk to that a bit more later on. Um, but I guess on the upside of that, the, the the pretty wet and sort of bleak conditions is is that we now move into spring with a, a full profile of soil moisture and. That's something that um, that it's always a good thing in, at this time of the year. So, how much moisture is is in the bank, if you like? Um, this screenshot here is is actually some information that the bureau provide. Um, it's it's it shows root zone soil moisture levels um, across the country, and I've just zoomed in here for New South Wales. And and not surprisingly, uh, it's showing that going into spring. Um, there is, you know, very, very good soil moisture, um, not just locally in that southeast corner, but you can see there that right across the state, there's actually, um, you know, a, 
average or above average soil moisture conditions across a large part of New South Wales. So a um, very good position to be in going into the start of spring. And more locally, um, we've been putting some soil moisture probes in the ground over the last five or so years. And so these are actually physical devices that are measuring uh, soil moisture in real time. And, and, and the, the soil, mo soil moisture system, which you can view on Farming Forecaster, these devices just basically back up what, what that previous slide was showing was that um, very wet conditions right across uh, the southeast region. Um, and you can see a lot of 100% being shown there, which is basically indicating that that moisture or that soil profile is, is fully saturated. So in Farming Forecast, uh, any, all of those dots and those squares there on the map are actually are actual sites where we show, or where we're measuring um, both soil moisture, but also providing a pasture outlook for spring. And so if I just zoom into one of these sites, and I've just done a screenshot of, of gunning um, by way of example, on the left-hand side of the screen there under the probe heading, you can see that we've got basically 100% soil moisture, i.e. fully saturated conditions in that top 60 centimetres. Um, so, you know, obviously very wet. And then on the right-hand side, under pasture forecast, this is now providing a pasture forecast for this site, um, and that's based on model data out of a, a computer program called GrassGrow. And, and if you haven't looked at one of these pasture forecasts before, I don't have a lot of time to go into in a lot of detail, but basically what we're really comparing is how do those those solid projection lines compare to, to history? And so that the shaded areas in the background, the red, uh, the the sort of the, the orangey shaded area and the green, that represents the, the normal range, if you like, in green pasture availability across the, the September to December period. Um, for, for gunning um, based on this modelled farm. And so what the pasture forecast is showing is that you can see those, those solid lines, those projection lines, they all start at the beginning of September way up on the tip of the, of the green zone. So what that's indicating is that current pasture availability is well, well above average for this time of the year. And we can see that Regardless, regardless really of what happens with, with in terms of future rainfall in spring, um, the, the, the three projection lines there largely all end up following um, in that in, or, or ended up in that green shaded zone, which is indicating a very positive um, pasture and pasture outlook indeed. So that's for the gunning site. If I travel down to the Monero, and I've, I've done a screenshot now for, for Bungarby, um, we can see a very, very similar situation. Um, again, on the left-hand side, a full profile of soil moisture. The pasture forecast starting well above average for this time of the year. And the, the, the chances are is that we will have extremely strong pasture growth and pasture availability um, right through spring there as well. And, and in actual fact, it doesn't really matter which site you click on on this Farming Forecaster website, um, the, the, the message is, is basically the same for spring. So moving on then, so that, that's a bit of a snapshot of where things currently sit in terms of soil moisture. Um, but also, it's also important to look at what, what the forecast is saying because, you know, history shows that you know, even though it's great to go into spring with, with a good amount of soil moisture, we still need um, moisture from above. And, and thankfully, the, the Bureau, with their forecasting, um, their three-month outlook is also very positive. And um, we've got, you know, basically two-thirds of the eastern two-thirds of the country um, is predicted to have a very high chance of above-average rainfall, at least for September and October. Um, and and so that, that's really important to note as well. And, and the other thing to note here is that forecast inaccuracy um, ebbs and flows throughout the year, depending on where you are. Um, but forecast inaccuracy for, for, for in, I guess, in our, our um, 
our environment or our location um, is is high for, for this time of the year. All right, so moving on to some pasture management, um, I guess tips for, for this spring. Um, I guess one of the challenges this spring, and it's a challenge that we really we we had last year as well, is is how do we actually manage this this big flush of green feed that that's that's coming? Um, so I guess it's it's impossible really to to be able to control everything. Um, so the concept really is to to try and target specific paddocks, um, and so in, in an effort to try and maintain pasture quality um, and squeeze as much as you can out of it out of those paddocks because if you try and if you try and manage your whole place um, you'll you'll just get swamped so it's really about prioritizing prioritizing paddocks um, when you when you're looking at a spring like we are so what paddocks might you target there's a couple of a couple of bullet points there. Um, I think are, are important points to to consider in this process. And the first being pasture quality. So targeting paddocks that that are relatively short, um, they've got a high quality or a good amount of, of green pasture that, that without a lot of dead material um, through through it. And also paddocks that are that have got you know a reasonable amount of, of legume content because we know that. That legumes are such a, an important driver in, in terms of livestock performance. So targeting paddocks that are that have been well grazed or well managed this year, um, and that are really set up in a, in an ideal phase or stage as we as we head into spring. In saying that, um, the second bullet point there really is what I'm really trying to say. There is that um, if you if you it, <laughs> I guess last year we're in a similar situation where you would have, you know, you probably would have targeted some paddocks and other paddocks got away. Um, this year it would be really worth considering um, mixing that, mixing those paddocks up a little bit so that some paddocks that that were let go last year, hopefully they you've managed to sort of get them back into some sort of um, order and they might be paddocks that you can really have a go at targeting this time around because one of the issues is, is that, if if you just target the same paddocks year in year out, um, and 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 the same paddocks are left to sort of get away, um, that can over time cause real issues in terms of a composition point of view. And and we know that um, legumes can really struggle um, in that circumstance in those circumstances or situations where um, they just they haven't really been able to you know because they've been out out competed able to to set seed and um, and, and re-establish. So, really trying to target target um, specific paddocks there, and um, and also trying to target paddocks in the landscape that will hang on for longer. So paddocks that will that they're a bit lower in the landscape, maybe better soil type. You know, paddocks that you know that you can you can graze a bit further into spring before they'll they'll start to dry out. Um, and the, the final bullet point there is is paddocks around bushfire. No doubt you'll have you'll have paddocks that are of high priority um, just simply from a from a fire risk uh, management point of view. So moving on, for those of you that have that have done um, progress, you'll you'll be familiar with this slide. Um, this shows the three phases of pasture growth and. So in, in phase one, which is typically where we are coming out of winter, you know, pastures are fairly short. Um, and then we go through this rapid growth phase in spring where pastures go through this reproduction phase and then set seed, um, set seed as well and, and, and go into that reproductive phase. The key thing to note here with this graph is that we want to try um, to try and keep pastures in phase two for as long as possible, because it's in phase two where we, we have the combination of um, both high growth rates, high pasture growth rates, but also where pasture quality is high as well. And, and so we're really trying to use, um, use grazing pressure um, where we can through spring to try and keep pastures in phase two for as long as possible. We won't, we won't stop 
that 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 process of passes moving into phase three that that will happen we're just trying to use grazing pressure to slow that process down so what is what does this actually look like in the paddock so here's an example of um of a pasture containing around about sort of 1400 to 2200 kilos of dry matter per hectare and and in my boots, that, that equates to roughly around the tip of the toe to about halfway up the elastic. Um, and so that's really, I guess, if you like, a bit of a rough range of where you'd, where you'd really try and keep pastures in that, in that five to 10 centimetre range for as long as you can in spring. And, and in September, um, you know, I wouldn't, be, I'd be, well, I wouldn't be concerned if you're targeting towards the lower end of that range because if pastures get away from you early on in spring, They'll, they'll build up such a head of steam that you really will, um, you'll find it hard to, to get them, you know, back, back into some sort of control. So, so going hard and going early is, is really, I guess, the key message there. So what sort of stocking rate might you need to try and keep these passes in this, in this ideal zone for as long as we can? Um, this table here is shows different pasture growth rates for um, for both September and October, um, so and also different elevations because obviously we've got a fair bit of uh, variability um, around the the region in terms of altitude and and what impact that has on growth. Um, but for September and October, I've I've estimated a growth rate here of around 40 kilos a day for for September and 50 for October. At, at five to six hundred meters, and then if you're in that higher elevation country, you can see that September and October growth rates um, are just a, a bit a bit lower um, because of being a bit a bit higher and a bit colder and, and later later in the like, later season. So th there's some growth rates that you could you could use as a guide, um, and these are just average monthly growth rates. And then really what we're trying to do is is if we're trying to balance Life, you know, pasture growth rate with livestock consumption. Um, I've just used the intake tables out of the ProGraze manual here to to try and balance these two things out. So, as as a rough guide, um, you'd be looking at around about two and a half cows and calves um, during September. So two and a half cows and calves to the hectare to balance out that forty kilos a day of growth, and then moving into, into October. We can see that that, growth, that stocking rate goes up because pasture growth rate goes up with with those warmer conditions. Um, and there's there's some some numbers there for for higher elevation country for September and October as well. And the bottom of the table, there's a line there for yearlings. Um, and we can just see, you know, I've just put some numbers there for yearlings as well. And basically, with the yearlings, as a rough rule of thumb, you're looking at an intake of about ten kilograms per head per day. So if you've got a growth rate of 40, you're looking at about four head per hectare to balance out that, that growth. So those are just some rules of thumb um, that you can use as a bit of a starting point. And um, there, are some, there are some assumptions down the bottom here that I've used. So um, with, with the cows and calves, I've assumed a mid-August calving. Um, and I've also assumed that these paddocks to get these sort of growth rates, you know, the, the paddocks that have got good fertility or good soil fertility um, with no major nutrient deficiencies. If you've got paddocks of, that have of fairly low fertility and I haven't seen uh, or haven't had much fertiliser input over the years, you would you, you'd, you, could, you could revise these pasture growth rates um, and, and, and stocking rates by about half as a, as a rough rule of thumb. All right, so moving on here, I've got a um, just an example of a pretty pretty good example, I think, of a paddock near Yass um, with some heifers, heifers and calves at foot. These heifers and these heifers started calving on the first of August, um, and they're calving over seven weeks. So they're um, at this point in time, they're almost finished calving. And this photo was taken at the start of the month, and that paddock there had about 1,100 kilos of green material in it. Um, and as you can see, the paddock's well grazed. Um, you know, as, 
not much dead material, residual sort of dead material there at all. So it's nice and open, um, well grazed, and high quality. You know, fairly short, but but high quality, highly digestible green food, which is really which is really uh, what we're aiming for. Um, stock in densities there. Those cows that are currently stocked um, at two two cows and calves per hectare. Um, and so I, based on that, I, I did a, a photo budget to say, well, if, if we if we keep if we assume that we've got eleven hundred kilos of dry matter at the start of September and we we continue to graze during September at two two heifers and their calves per hectare, if we assume a, a growth rate of forty, um, a day, then at the end of September, that paddock will have moved to a herbage mass of about 1,600 kilos. So that's actually a pretty good a pretty good result. Um, it means that by the end of September, that paddock has hasn't got too far advanced. It's it's still with well within that that ideal range that we're talking about. But for October, um, we know that as conditions warm up, pasture growth rates will also increase and the start of October could be quite a good opportunity if you're trying to keep a bit more pressure on this paddock um, to actually increase the stocking rate slightly. So if we if we combine some some mobs and um, a lifted stocking rate up to three heifers to the hectare um, and factor in a pasture growth rate of 50 for October, at the end of that month, um, herbage mass gets to about 17 to 1800 kilos, which is which is still very good. Um, and then if we plan out to November and hold that stocking rate at three to the hectare, um, the paddock gets to about 2,200 kilos by the end of November. So that's just a, a little example there, um, sort of back of the envelope sort of stuff where you can, where you, can you know, factor in um, and plan out how you might go about matching stocking rate to pasture growth rate to try and keep keep pastures under some sort of control as we move through spring. All right, um, and just to finish off then, um, I've just got a couple of slides here and it's, these slides are really just, just a good example, I guess, of how grazing management um, can really have a positive impact, not just on on livestock performance this spring, um, but it can also have a pretty big impact on um, setting paddocks up for the future. So here we have a fence line comparison, and this was taken in spring last year. And um, the paddock on the left uh, was crash grazed in December last year. So at the end of the, at the end of spring last year, the paddock on the left was crash grazed with weathers to really remove um, a, a quite a large bulk of, of, of material. The paddock on the right hand side was not crash grazed. And so what happened there is we came around to the start of this year and we can see the, the, the impact that had. So the paddock on the left, which was crash grazed, started off this year um, in a very open state, ready for those opening autumn rains. Um, the paddock on the right hand side, which didn't get the crash grazing, you can see there that there was just an overburden of, of old um, of old dead material, and a lot of that was just was Michaelina um, seed heads or stems. So what we did was we tried to crash graze that paddock, that, and it's, it's a seven hectare paddock, and we put 500 weathers in with the aim of trying to remove some of that dead material. And the problem was though was that underneath all that dead material there was quite a lot of um green green pick um and so the weathers were more interested in chasing that green pick and and didn't really take much notice unfortunately of of the dead material which we we're trying to bust up and and reduce so that even at those stocking densities that the crash graze um didn't prove overly successful and then if we fast forward to um a couple of months ago same two paddocks, but you can just see that the the old dead material is 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 even there still still even today, um, and is still having a I guess an ongoing impact in terms of pasture quality and and growth rates and livestock performance and and the whole the whole box and dice. So it's just a, it's just an example um, 
a nice example of how you know paddocks that you're able to put a bit of time into this spring um not only will you squeeze more out of them and and, and achieve better livestock performance now um but those paddocks will also be in a better position going forward they'll be better off in terms of their ability to capitalize on any summer rainfall you might get um but also being well grazed they'll be in a better position um into, into next year as well with 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 the autumn break so um, I will leave it at that and I will hand over to Jeff. Thanks, Matt. If I can find the switch presenter button, I'll be all right. <laughs> Here we go, Jeff. It should be coming your way now. Yep, no, that was good. Oh, no. So hopefully you can see my screen now. Yep, that's all good, Jeff. Excellent. Thanks, Matt. Righty. -o. Thank you very much. And yeah, welcome everyone this afternoon. Um, my name's Jeff House. I'm uh, Jeff House Livestock based at Forbes in central west New South Wales. Um, I think over the years I've probably met a number of the people that are that are on the the webinar today and um, yeah, look forward to catching up again when, when things settle down a bit. Uh, I've been um, previously was with the Department of Agriculture, DPI, based here in Forbes as the District Livestock Officer Beef Cattle and since 2014 I've, I've had my own uh, livestock consulting business, Jeff House Livestock, working with both uh, feedlots and producers and, and also still doing a little bit of work with processes as well. So. Um, today, I just want to talk a little bit about um, sort of some of the marketing options people might have going forward and, you know, what are the feedlots and the processes um, sort of doing. I suppose really um, any talk about markets at the moment, really it, it's hard to uh, to start with anything other than the um, the ECI, which, which gets talked about a, a fair bit and gets a fair bit of publicity as to where it's at. But really, it, it's quite amazing what's happened in the beef industry in the last two years. So in this graphic here, uh, the line down the bottom here uh, on the right hand side, that's uh, the ECI from 2019. So it just displays the two years where it was sort of sitting around that 500 cents per kilo carcass weight. So of course the ECI is on a, a carcass weight basis. Um, and then we see that steep rise early in 2020 uh, and then it sort of sat around that 800 cents um, for a bit there towards the end of 2020. And then, of course, this year it's it's gone up and, and moved past that $10 a, a kilo mark. So, you know, really some big, big differences there in, in prices being paid for cattle. Um, unfortunately, I don't have a, a crystal ball that can tell everybody where exactly that's going to be sitting in three months' time or five or six months' time. But... Um, you know, a lot of the uh, the underlying fundamentals in the market at the moment are quite strong. And so that's sort of, you know, what, what's driving the current cattle market? Um, it, it's very much, and, and people have probably heard this, it's very much being driven by supply. So as we're coming out of, out of the drought, um, people are trying to build numbers back up that have, have been depleted. And of course, the Eki is, is across the whole eastern states of Australia. So it's Queensland, New South Wales and Victoria. And, you know, there's, there's some areas there that have seen some massive uh, reductions in cattle numbers. Um, some areas, of course, have been impacted a lot more than others. So there are, are areas where, where numbers are still quite strong. But overall, on that eastern seaboard of Australia, numbers are, are, are back a long way. So it's really that lack of supply that is really driving the increases in price. Demand on the other side is still quite strong, like global demand. And of course, Australia exports you know, over 70% of our production. So we really are talking on a global scale. Global demand for, for beef is still really strong as well. Um, but you know, ultimately the prices we're seeing are, are very much driven by supply, and and both the the processes and the feedlot is trying to um, to maintain their their throughput in animals through through feedlots and through their plants. 
another interesting factor that's sort of come out in the in the last well these has actually occurred in the last two quarters so this was the march quarter and the june quarter grain fed beef in australia has been 50 percent of the total beef production in the country now that's that's the first time um, those two quarters are the first time that it's actually got to that higher level probably if we go back two or three years it was probably sitting at 35 percent 30 to 35 percent of beef production but we've actually seen quite a steep increase in in that so grain fed cattle for the last quarter made up about 45 percent of all slaughtering uh, but the average carcass weight being a little bit heavier meant that they actually made up 50% of, of total beef production. In terms of, if we look at slaughter numbers, they're down 24%. So again, this was the, the June quarter figures. Um, slaughter numbers for the quarter were down 24% compared to 2020. Now, going further into the year, um, relative to 2020, probably don't expect to see that bigger uh, decrease because that was actually when sort of numbers started to, to drop off was the back half of 2020 so um, still some massive decreases compared uh, back to 2019 um, which was a was actually quite a, a large slaughter year partly drought driven as well but um, we've really seen a, a great decrease in, in the number of animals being slaughtered interestingly however we've actually seen an increase in carcass weights um, so Carcasses averaged 310 kilos per head, uh, again for the June quarter, which was up 23 kilos compared to that same quarter in uh, 2020. So there's sort of a it's all in the grain fed. Um, the sort of production there would be be adding to carcass weight because generally our, our grain fed carcasses are a bit heavier. Um, the number of cattle slaughter was down. Um, so, you know, interestingly in that period, um, the, the throughput or the, the output from feedlots was actually only down 3%. So again, contributing to that increased percentage of, of beef, which is actually coming out of feedlots on a, on a national scale. And I think part of that is, is very much um, supply chains trying to shore up some sort of supply going forward. So if you're getting cattle coming out of the feedlot, then you know, depending on your feeding program, it might be 100 days. Uh, for some of the long fed cattle, you know, it's 200, 300 days ahead, what cattle you've actually already got in the supply chain lined up for, for slaughter on a particular date. Um, that's much more difficult to, to get a handle on from a processor's point of view at the moment, um, when they're, they're sort of out in the market trying to source cattle. So if we look, look at from a feedlot's point of view these are numbers on feed so each quarter MLA and Alpha the Australian Lot Feeders Association do a, a survey of feedlot operators and they record information uh, based on numbers on feed and New South Wales and Queensland are by far the biggest states in Australia when it comes to to grain feeding so that's why these numbers are presented here so if we look at the blue line on the bottom is, is New South Wales. So since 2010, um, you know, numbers on feed have, have risen by about 100,000. Um, we've gone from sort of 200,000 up to sort of that, that 300,000 sort of number. Um, and if we look nationally, or sorry, in Queensland, um, you know, they've seen a much bigger rise. So they've gone from about the 400,000 in the last 10 years now up to about 700,000. And there was actually quite a steep um, increase in numbers on food in the last quarter in Queensland. Not, not so much in New South Wales, sort of numbers have, have stayed a bit more um, consistent. But yeah, and this very much um, a, a big part of this was, was drought um, affected up there in Queensland and, and being able to source cattle. So we had those together and, you know, Australia in the last quarter, um, you know, we were, we're sort of sitting a bit, you know, almost approaching that 1.2 million head of cattle on feed uh, for for the quarter, which, you know, has really only been beaten by that that one time back in in 2019 where we we pipped over that 1.2 million. So, lots of cattle on feed, um, and look, generally speaking, that that's still the ongoing trend. Most of the bigger feedlots are, are still quite full, 
and have big numbers of cattle on feed. There's a lot of smaller opportunity feedlots at the moment that, are, that aren't in the market and, and don't necessarily have cattle on feed. Um, the economics there are a bit tight in terms of feeding. So some of those economies of scale that we, we get out of the bigger feedlots. As Matt sort of mentioned, you know, the, the wet period and, and the cooler weather through winter, while it's been a bit challenging on, on pasture systems, um, you know, again, has presented quite a challenging uh, period for, for feedlots in the south in terms of animal performance and the like. So, you know, they're, they're coming out of a, a pretty tough period there with a, the cold weather and, and wet weather. Um, so performance during winter in, in our southern feedlots definitely hasn't been as, as good as, as what it would have been in a dry winter. Um, you know, hopefully as we move forward, we get a bit more drying weather and that, that performance is, is definitely going to pick up. But one of the comments that I hear from a, a number of feedlots um, is very much around, you know, the, the supply uh, going in. Um, often at this time of year, feedlots would, would have cattle potentially booked up for, for a number of weeks in advance. So again, they know that they've got cattle coming at them. Um, it's very much a week to week process at the moment. So, um, you know, there's not that that certainty there, even on numbers on feed, they're out there trying to purchase cattle, um, often quite, you know, in quite short turnaround um, to get their numbers to put cattle on the feed. So again, that's, that's driving some of those things we're seeing in prices. Um, and I'll, I'll come back to that in a, in a little bit too as well. Sometimes, um, just to break down the ecchi, so just sometimes you've got to be a little bit careful when we look at the ecchi, as you would expect, um, but it does look at a number of different types. So it's, it's looking at, at both vela cattle and, and also um, sort of those yearling cattle, but it's taking, looking at sale yards information, and it's looking at animals that are purchased by uh, feeders, so feeder cattle that are going into feedlots, uh, cattle that are purchased by processors, but then also cattle purchased by restockers. So those three market segments make up the cattle that go into the ecchi. And it really can vary quite considerably. This is a, a sort of breakdown that um, you can obtain off the MLA site uh, in their market information. And down the bottom, or I'm sorry, the graph at the top shows, you know, the percentage of cattle that made up the ecchi last Friday. So this is from uh, Friday last week. Now the ecchi is also a seven day rolling average. Um, so it's really, you know, these are looking at the cattle that made up the ecchi for the last seven days um, as of Friday last week. So 46, 47% of those animals were restocker cattle. Uh, 38, 39% were, were feeder cattle, and you're only looking there at about 14.5% that were actually purchased by processors. So, you know, there's different weightings at different times of year and how active different segments of the market are. But also in the table down the bottom, it just shows you the different prices that are actually being paid by those three different market segments. So you'll see there on an um, average cents per kilo carcass weight, and I've just added that that third column there. Um, if we assume a 55% dressing percentage, just to bring back that back to a live weight price as well. Um, you'll see at the bottom there, restockers are paying, you know, over that $10 a kilo uh, for animals. Um, next, uh, the feeders paying $9.90 on a carcass weight basis. And then processors, uh, $9.10 for those young cattle at, at the bottom, which you know, equating from five dollars one to to five ninety two cents per kilo live weight, so there is actually quite a range in in what the different um, market segments are actually willing to pay for cattle, and we need to keep that in mind as well as as we're heading forward. You know, just just be mindful. You might hear the ecchi values, you know, um, promoted on the radio, and and we often hear those in the market reports but they're not necessarily reflective of exactly the type of cattle you're looking to sell. And also it's across the whole East state. So we need to be a little bit careful of that. This is a, an analysis that Mercado did not long ago um, that just spells out that, that sort of difference in price over um, from January 19, right through to, um, you know, it was, I think it was the start of August this year. And what they've got there, so the blue line is the restocker part of the ecchi. So they've basically taken that data 
um, from the MLA report. And actually this left-hand column here is actually, that's price, it's not thousands of head, it's actually um, cents per kilo. So we've got the restock as the blue line. The black dotted line here is actually the ECI that's reported. Um, then you've got this, this orangey coloured line underneath, which is the feeder price. And then down the bottom here is the processor. Now, you know, some of that is really to do with competition and what can happen. So really those cattle, the processors are purchasing um, in here, probably uh, maybe some of those cattle that are a little bit more in forward in condition, maybe not as suitable earlier maturing types um, that aren't as suitable to grow out and not as suitable to go on as feeders. And so, you know, they're picking them up at a, at a you know, they've got less, um, I suppose, opportunity going forward. Um, compared to, to those animals that have been picked up as restockers or feeders that are, that are going to put weight on and, and move forward. But again, it's just really important people um, are aware of how that's made up and, and the different contribution each makes. Now, these are the say yard indicators. So, you know, this is some of the data that does go into the ECI. These are, are New South Wales figures only, um, again, for, for last week. And it's really, it's the restocker steers, um, feeder steers, vela and trade steers, it's really these categories here, plus the heifers as well, um, the equivalent heifers that go into the ecchi. But you'll see as we progress down, and it's what happens all the time, um, you know, it shouldn't be of any surprise, but as animals are getting heavier, then the price per kilo that's paid for them is, is reducing. And so that's where we just need to be a little bit careful again as we move forward, plenty of feed around and, and trying to make decisions on when we might actually look to market cattle. So, you know, we look at a, a vealer steer here, here, 280 to 330, you know, $6.30. Um, you know, that same animal is, a, or, you know, taken on for another 100 kilos thereabouts into a feeder, um, you know, $5.34. So, the, you know, there's a dollar a kilo live weight reduction there. And then as they keep moving down here, by the time they're to a medium steer, we're talking $4.59 versus a heavy steer, $4.48. So as animals get heavier, their cents per kilo it does decrease. And again, it's, it is around, um, in some ways, that opportunity of what we can do with that animal going forward. Once we're getting to those heavy steers, you know, they're, they're ready for slaughter. Um, there, there's less sort of market opportunities there. So if we look forward, um, you know, again, I, I would imagine there'd be people out there at the moment, um, as we look forward into this spring, you know, the data that Matt's already presented around growth rates and, and the like, um, if you're back in, in terms of your cattle numbers, then there's probably a lot of people considering retaining animals for longer um, and maybe trying to grow animals out to a bit heavier weights than what they more normally would do, um, just to allow them to utilize that feed and, and actually um, try and make uh, you know a bit more out of what's what's there on the property, uh, especially if your cattle numbers are back, so you're a little bit understocked anyway. Well, realistically, um, you know the market going forward is, is still very much going to be supply driven. Um, there's, there's not really going to be uh, a, you know big increase in numbers that, as it takes time for the herd to rebuild and, and build back up again. So again, going forward, you know, would imagine prices are, are going to stay quite strong. There may be times when, for example, um, there may well be a, a flush of, of cattle coming off grass um, that may, you know, bring prices back a little bit. But realistically, the the strength in the market there looks as though it's going to be there for some time coming ahead. So then the real decision is okay. Do we look at feeder cattle or process you know, cow, cattle to go for kill? And you know, I'm sure most people have seen this sort of chart before, um, where we just look at some of the basic carcass specifications that are out there. Um, you know, this is for slaughter cattle, approximate sort of live weights and, and carcass weights. And you know, you've sort of got your domestic butcher type market, those lighter animals, um, up into the domestic supermarkets, so your coals and woolies type cattle. Those, those markets have got heavier and heavier um, as, as times progressed. Um, so, you know, there's, there's some of those cattle now getting out to sort of three, three, uh, 300, 320 kilos dressed. And then we move into sort of those heavy export markets. 
So it's it's really important that as you start to grow those animals out, yeah. you you keep track. So just from where they're sitting, um, for an example, this is um, this is an example of this is the ginger leaf feeder for feeder cattle. It's an example here. Um, because really, there's there's quite a crossover between those those feeder cattle and, and some of those lighter weight um, type processing markets, um, and this just gives you an idea. There's a few things in here that, that people need to be aware of, and I really encourage people to talk to their buyers, talk to their agents, try and gather as much information as you possibly can around where the market's at, and and you know what you might be able to lock into or, or see in the future. Um, these uh, prices for for both steers and heifers. Here, you'll notice um, there's a bit of a signal that the, the feedlots or, or teas are trying to send out there to producers. Um, up here, you know, they're willing to take Angus steers down to 300 kilos, and they're looking to pay, you know, potentially $6.20 um, a kilo for those animals. The, the British or the Euro um, type animals, 580 in that sort of weight range. Now, traditionally, that's a, a weight range that they probably wouldn't be buying in. They're lighter than what they would normally want. Um, so these are animals that they're really looking to potentially um, either background or, or maybe put onto a, onto a ration to just grow them a little bit slower. But it's it's about trying to, to shore up some sort of supply going forward, which is, is really challenging for them at the moment. Um, the 360 to, to sort of 500 kilos, the, the more traditional type weights um, for, for this company, um, you know, you, you're sort of that 570, 5, 550 for, for Angus steers, um, your British and Euro down 530, and you, you sort of back a little bit um, for your heifers in that, that feeding program just because of the um, uh, the sort of don't get as, as good a performance out of the, the heifers in the feedlot. You'll notice, you know, if you start going up, um, you know, you can go up to sort of 520 uh, and there's, there's a relatively small um, sort of drop off in price. But if you go over 520 kilos live weight, then it, it's quite a significant drop off there. Um, likewise, if, if you sort of, you know, down at that lighter end, um, you know, down to 280, it isn't a massive drop off for most, you know, with milk teeth, there's, there's some significant drops and it's not huge. Um, but if you get outside of that, then, then you know, the discounts are really quite big. So no, it's just sending a really strong message that they don't want cattle outside of those specs. So. Really, that 300 to, to 500 kilos with milk teeth, they're the sort of animals they're looking at and, and looking to, um, to to pay quite nicely for. So again, if you've got cattle out there in the paddock at the moment at these sort of prices, you know, if they're doing a kilo per head to the, per week, oh, kilo per head per day, then you're looking at something, you know, they're adding value of about $37 a week. Um, if they're doing 1.2, then it's sort of 45. And if, if they're doing 1.4 kilos per head per day, then you know, you're over $50 a week that you're actually increasing the value of those animals at that sort of $5.30 mark. So it, it's quite quite a, a strong message there that you know they're trying to draw some cattle out. Likewise, those lighter cattle, you know, if you're, you sell a line of, of feeder cattle here um, at that sort of three, 350 kilos, um, at that 580, you know, they're going to return you better than $2,000 a head. If you put that weight on and keep them going, then you've got to put about 30 or 40 kilos back more on them um, to get them into that next weight category. But if you take them right back to, you know, towards a 450 or, or even getting closer to a 500, you know, then they're, they're returning you, you know, almost two and a half thousand dollars per head. So, you know, there's some really good returns there. If we then look at, um, again, this is the T's processing grid. Um, and again, really encourage people, get out there, talk to your, your buyers, um, get, try and get as much information out of the market as you can. This is, this is the grid for last week. Um, you'll notice sort of 300 to 320s, sort of the bottom, well, I've highlighted the sort of the top prices in each of these grids here. So Grasslands is the, the T's grass fed product um, brand. Um, it's their program. So, you know, that's for producers that are registered with that. And again, I'd really encourage people to look at that and, and talk to them, talk to their buyers about those sort of programs. Most of the companies now have 
those sort of grass programs. So if you're not sort of adding, um, you know, feeding these cattle grain, if they're straight off grass, then, you know, really talk to those buyers about what's involved in those programs. Because, you know, there's some significant premiums here. And there's also an advantage here where you can take those cattle out to a heavier weight than what you can for the Angus or the, or you're just your straight MSA type of animal. So there's scope there. We've got more cents per kilo, but we can also take those cattle out to a heavier weight. So really the specs here, you know, 300 kilos up um, to 360 for your Angus and your MSA. Uh, if they drop out of the MSA, then that's when we, we start falling down into these other categories. But look, really encourage people to, to try and talk to their buyers, get as much information about where they're going. Because even though this, this next graph just shows there is potentially some crossover in these um, two grids. So if you're looking to put weight on cattle and grow them out and, and take them potentially beyond a feeder into a, a beast that you would, you would look at getting processed, if we're at the top end of the feeder grid, um, they're sitting at, at that sort of $5.30 at the moment um, live weight, then we're sort of about a 450 kilo beast, um, potentially up to 500. So, you know, you can take them a bit heavier. Um, 500 was the top of that grid. But at 450 kilos, that animal's going to return you a bit better than um, or almost 2,500. If you then step up into the um, processing grid, then really to get to the bottom, this sort of 300 kilo weight, which was was the, the cutoff for the, the base price, um, 280 was just a fraction back. But to get to this 300 kilos, you're then looking at about a 550 kilo animal. So potentially put another 100 kilos on them, um, but your return is about the same. Because your, your animal's getting heavier, then, then you know, your return's about the same. Uh, if we take it to the top end, to this 360 kilo carcass weight, and you're looking at an animal that's about 650 kilos live weight, then you know, you're getting close to $3,000 for that animal um, based on that grid, assuming you're, this is the MSA steer grid. So um, we're not taking into account breed there. So you've sort of increased in value by you know, somewhere around that five to $600 but you've actually put an extra 200 kilos life weight on that animal. So for every kilo you've put on, you, you've only, you're only actually gaining another $3 a kilo because of that decrease um, in value in cents per kilo when you go from a lighter animal to a heavier animal. So it's really important that people sit down and, and do their sums and look at, at those sort of things going forward. Because look, really, you know, the, the weight you can add uh, you know, it, it's increasing the overall dollars per head, but it does become at a, a bit of a um, diminishing return. So just be really careful and, and really do your sums on and get as much information as you can from, from your different um, sources, the different markets you might be looking to aim at. The other thing, of course, to think about too, um, in terms of our MSA compliance, really important so with to meet that msa grid you've of course you've got to meet the minimum requirements for msa so that's three mils of, of fat on the rib your ph at 5.7 or below and, and an even distribution of fat coverage uh, on that carcass now for you know for most of those carcasses sort of up over that 300 kilos that that shouldn't be a problem but what we've got to be a little bit careful about, this is a, a chart from, from the um, Australian Beef Eating Quality Insights, which is an MLA publication they put out about every three years. So this is data from 17 to 19. Um, we do tend to see a, a, a bit of an increase in um, pH non-compliance, especially when we get into that sort of January, February, March period. Now this is for the whole of New South Wales and ACT. Um, so it, it is very seasonal, um, but what we can see is, is as past that pasture starts to mature and that image that Matt showed um, of that, that pasture on the right hand side with a lot of dead material, um, that can slow our growth rate down considerably and those animals aren't getting enough energy to and, and glycogen in their muscle to convert that into uh, and to drive that pH lower. So sometimes as, as we start to get, the animals got plenty of fat on them and they still look really good and 
they look really finished, but because they're no longer on that rising plane of nutrition, then we can run into problems um, with those animals actually dropping back and, and you know, having an increase in the number of dark colours, which can really be a problem. So really, yeah, encourage people to be cautious of that. Keep those animals going forward um, and, and on that rising plane of nutrition, um, before you're, you're looking to sort of send them through to slaughter. That, that is a really important uh, factor there. So look, I really um, encourage people to get as much information as they can. And, and also just to, um, to be really mindful. If you're looking to grow animals out to a heavier weight than what you would normally do, yeah, just, just be mindful of, of the fact that you are decreasing your, your cents per kilo on a, on a live weight basis. Yeah, so that's me done. Now, I'm just sorry, Matt. I'm just having trouble seeing the option here to hand the. That's okay, Jeff. I might be able to do that from here. Oh, actually, sorry. I've just got it here now. So okay, you're uh, all right. Hand over to Alex. Yep. And so that should now be to you, Alex. Hopefully, you can get that one. Thank you very much. I'll just work out how to, yep, I'm all good. Right. Um, how did that go? So, um, yep, that's great, Alex. What? Thanks, Matt. Thank you. I'm just gonna minimize that one. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Hold on a minute. Just gonna try and move this out of the way. Um so, sorry, fine, I'm organized. Um so yeah, good morning. I'm Alex, so I'm um the district vet for the local land services here based at Yas. Uh, I've been a district vet for a bit over a bit over 10 years, a bit of time here and a bit of time in Cooma. Um, also a, um, I suppose a, a small cattle producer myself, that some of my over-conditioned cows and um, um, married to a, a farmer as well. So um, I've certainly been listening intently to um, to Jeff's words, you know, I'm also in it in that decision of, you know, do you buy or do you sell, and all the all the animal health problems that everyone else has had, as well. I'm in there trying to manage them myself as well. So, um, what a long and wet winter we've had, uh, and um, very tough on sheep, uh, but yeah, it's been been tough on cattle in in different ways too, and. Um, we're going to be looking obviously at a very big spring ahead with record high cattle prices and in in my experience high cattle prices make producers particularly jumpy and concerned about animal health um, and there's no doubt doubt we're going to face our usual spring challenges ahead and um, yeah it just hurts all the more when um, things are worth that much more um, I'm just going to provide a short reminder of some of the challenges that we're going to face over the next couple of months and also just recap on the problems we saw uh, over the winter. So each of the topics that I'm talking about are really one hour talks in themselves. Um, and so if you're particularly interested in any of the topics, I would really recommend, you know, obviously either talk to your district vet or there's also you can Google the MLA productivity and profitability webinars which are excellent and they've got lots of excellent webinars. There's one on grass technique and there's one on bloat, for example. So starting by looking back over the winter, um, we had the highest reported losses that I have ever heard of cows dying from grass technique this winter. Um, it occurred on cattle grazing on pastures, um, especially when they were on short green grass and where, and where they did have a little bit of roughage, it had become quite old and less palatable. Um, it was also very high risk due to the low clover component of pastures going through the winter this year. 
Um, the low soil temperatures also played a factor and there were just so many days of cloud cover and then also rainy, windy weather. The soil and plant dy dynamics resulted in basically low salt and magnesium levels and high potassium levels in the grasses, which limit the magnesium availability in the rumen. Um, and cattle also would have reduced their grazing time in the bad weather. Um, this problem was widespread across the tablelands, not just in our area. What was really frustrating was that it occurred on many occasions where loose licks were out and it was really, um, you know, so wet and not possible to get hay out to affected paddocks. Um, grass tetany cows often present with sudden death, but with also with signs of leg paddling indicating seizuring before death. But other telltale signs of behaviour can be um, aggressive or high-headed, silly behaviour. Um, and if you find them down, you'll see down with convulsions, paddling of the legs and frothing at the mouth. So our, our, it's a disease of mostly um, of lactating stock, particularly middle-aged, so six years or so, Angus cows on crop. Um, and But we've also seen it on grass-dominated pastures, uh, particularly this year because of the little clover and little roughage. So prevention is about feeding more roughage or hay to encourage rumination. Um, which it increases the, the rumen and that availability of the magnesium. Um, or also just having them on a clover-based pasture. So how long are we going to need to continue supplementation? This year I've been asked, well, pro probably possibly until the diet that they're intaking becomes more balanced. Ideally, um, ideal prevention involves topping the hay with magnesium in the form of cause mag, which you make up in water, Importantly, cows need regular daily intake of magnesium to maintain their blood levels. Um, our advice also is to avoid stress. But what I'd say to that is that doesn't mean avoiding calf marking and vaccination um, and necessary things. It means don't cause unnecessary stress, such as holding the cattle in the yards off feed overnight for processing the next day, for example. So we had a lot of deaths in cattle this winter and most were put down to or shown to be grass tetany. But we did have other health disorders at play. Other, another cause of death we had this season was ketosis or pregtox. So ketosis is a, a negative and energy balance that can set up particularly where we have more heavily conditioned cattle as, as a result of reducing their feed intake um, such that was caused by what we had for so many days of bad weather. Um, it's, a, it's a metabolic disease that occurs in the last six weeks of pregnancy where the energy demands of the cow and the calf she's carrying is very high. And if her energy demands are not being met, she loses, and if she loses weight, loses weight slowly, this is okay. But if, if she's very fat and loses weight suddenly, the toxic waste from the breakdown accumulate in and damage the liver. Uh, and these cattle then become inappetent and go down. And usually they're spotted as downers where they remain there, basically. Um, but this season, I think uh, the low magnesium also contributed to them rapidly um, progressing to death as well. Um, more death. So um, on to concerns for the season ahead. Um, the first, as I was saying, the, the, the first question I'd received is how much longer is the grass tetany risk going to go on? I think possibly until our pastures get more balanced with good clover component um, and roughage. So the previous winter we had very little problem with grass tetany, but we lost lots of cattle to bloat. Whereas this winter we've had minimal bloat issues and lots, lost lots of cattle to grass tetany and ketosis. So I think in some ways it's going to be hard to predict what the bloat risk is going to be this spring. I think it's going to be very pasture and paddock dependent. In paddocks where the grazing has opened them right up, there should be good clover germination and there might be very significant bloat risk in these paddocks. But in pastures that are still quite overgrown with grasses and very grass dominant, the bloat risk may remain low. The important thing is being able to look at your pastures and your cattle and know when to feel concerned about which disorder. 
So cattle with bloat will commonly present dead, but what we want to look out for is the earlier indicators, such as the distension of the abdomen, particularly in that left flank area, and often that grunting respiration. So our younger cattle with less grazing experience are most at risk, and a sudden change in a diet can also cause bloat. So um, often the pastures that give us the highest productions are the ones that, that are the highest risk of causing bloat. Um, so it's always a trade-off um, with production gains versus bloat risk. In understanding the control of bloat, we need to understand what causes it. Bloat is actually a frothy bloat, not a gaseous bloat in most cases. It's caused by the entrapment of the normal gases of fermentation that are normally burped out, um, get entrapped by a stable form, foam that forms in the rumen. And this foam is caused by a kind of slime, which is created by the proliferation of bacteria, which grow on certain carbohydrate rich diets. So you get the growth of that bacteria, the growth of the slime, and then that creates the, the right environment for the foam. So that helps us to understand the prevention options. So firstly, the prevention of bloat involves, you know, on introduction to the high risk pastures, you've got to start on a foam destabiliser. You've got to start on the bloat prevention before they go onto the pasture and then ideally feed them full of dry hay to fill the room and then reduce engorgement before letting them on. You then need to closely monitor, monitor them that day and daily afterwards until you feel more comfortable that they're, they're, they're going okay. But the, the long-term reduction on high-risk pastures um, involves using any one of these next three options, um, including having roughage in the diet in the form of um, just a lower quality hay. Um, and the second is allowing um, access to an active that destabilises the foam. And this is either an oil or a, a detergent. So a detergent is alcohol ethoxylate, and that's the active ingredient, ingredient in most bloat blocks. It can be purchased actually as bloat oil in a pure formulation to mix with molasses or salt or fed in, a, in the block formation. But they need to consume at least about 10 mils of the active daily, which equates to about 100 grams of a bloat block, which is um, often why we'll still get losses when we have bloat blocks out. The third option is, 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 is kind of newer and older, but newer and becoming more popular, which is to feed a loose lick, which contains an antibacterial agent such as remensin or, or menensin. And this is, an, is, um, this is what was active in the old bloat capsules, but they haven't been available for about seven years and, and not likely to be put back on the market anytime soon. But um, so the loose lick is what we've got instead. And this product is effective um, and it also gives you a production advantage of increased weight gain. But again, as with the problem with any of the bloat pre preventions, that they need to be consuming it adequately in order for it to be effective. So um, more dead cattle. <laughs> uh, any pastures that are high risk for bloat are also high risk for pulpy kidney. Uh, and that's why we advise a, a booster five in one vaccine for bloat control, as some bloat losses are probably not bloat, they would probably pulpy kidney. So pulpy kidney um, is caused by circumstances which result in this time abnormally high growth of the normal gut clostridial bacteria, um, but its growth and its resultant toxin. So it's a, again a, uh, associated with rapid changes of diet. Uh, but also feeding on high energy diets. So um, rapidly growing um, weaned or but, and sometimes unweaned carved, calves are the highest at risk, um, especially those on really lush pastures. So animals are often found dead or will go down convulse and die quickly. Um, so pulpy kidney can be pre prevented through vaccination using a five in one or, or similar vaccine. So effective vaccination starts with your vaccination of your cows pre-calving or, or pre-testing. The calves are thus protected through antibody transfer in the milk. 
So calves then need an, an initial injection and then a booster four to eight weeks later to be fully vaccinated. Uh, the second booster is very important for effective vaccination. Um, to, to build this into your normal routine, the first vaccination, of course, occurs at calf marking, at, you know, as the bulls go out, and then your second vaccination is due as the bull, bulls are pulled out. So younger stock are the most at risk, so we usually recommend giving them more shots. You can't do any harm by giving too many vaccination boosters of five in one. I usually advise giving another booster at weaning in autumn and then another going into spring if conditions are high risk. Um, pulpy kidney risk is also reduced in a similar way to reducing bloat, bloat risk. And this is um, by adding more fibre into the diet and avoiding sudden diet changes. Um, so on to yeah, other problems we've had this season. This season, we seem to have had a higher than usual reported reports of stillborn calves. Um, causes may have been uh, over-conditioned cows and heifers and or possibly lower calcium and magnesium um, blood levels resulting in slower calving um, and or and larger calves due to the season perhaps. However, whenever we have a higher incidence, it's important to rule out infectious causes by contacting your vet and ideally getting them to the calf or the calf to them. Uh, and the vet will often then want to come and blood test a group of the affected cows. Uh, the main diseases we're ruling out or have been ruling out this season have been pestivirus. We've had cases of listeriosis, which it is usually caused by um, in poorly in silage, but this year by rotting vegetation on the ground. Um, and then we also we rule out leptospirosis, toxoplasma and, and arboviruses, mosquito-borne viruses. So I'm always going to take every opportunity to raise awareness about pestivirus, um, BVDV. Um, pestivirus is a disease that you can vaccinate against, which has a high prevalence in herds in our area. Um, it just cycles in and out of herds. It's a real profit thief. It causes, it basically causes problems when a cow that has never previously been infected with the virus becomes infected while pregnant. And if this occurs, it results in failure con to conceive, aborted calves, stillborn calves, and persistently infected calves that will die um, early later. So it can be introduced as easily as over the fence or by buying in trade stock. So um, prevention involves a yearly vaccination of your breeding herd, most importantly, starting with your two doses to your heifers at, before joining. So talking vaccinations, I'm also just going to mention um, bovine respiratory disease. Uh, it is the most common cause of losses and deaths in feedlots. Um, but and it's caused by um, stress, um, the stress of a new environment, the um, stress of a new diet, uh, co-mingling and, you know, the circulating viruses going around there. So it can occasionally, um, every season, I get some reports of it affecting young trade cattle on pastures, but usually not at high levels. I often get asked about vaccination. I think it's worth mentioning this year to say that feedlots will now often offer a premium for vaccinated stock or will they even not buy unvaccinated stock. So it's worth, again, as Jeff said, talk to your buyers and see what they want because it may pay you to vaccinate um, beforehand and you get the benefit of that vaccine for protecting your stock as well. Um, another problem just to mention that we always see uh, in spring coming into summer is pink eye. Um, so pink eye is a bacterial infection of the eye um, ca caused most specifically usually by the Moraxilla bovis um, bacteria. It is spread by flies. The irritation to the eye by wind and dust and long grass will predispose cattle to pink eye. It starts eye, eye tearing and then the flies were attracted to those tears. Um, cattle that have not been previously exposed uh, such as our, our young stock are the most at risk, particularly in the spring and the summer. So pink eye is very painful, obviously, and so treatment and prevention is advised. So I, I wanted to mention prevention as in, because um, it is best started at calf marking. 
with, and you can use the specific pink eye Pilligard vaccine. And this vaccine works well against not all, but most of the strains of the pink eye bacteria. And by vaccinating as calves, you also end up protecting them, not just for that first summer, but also it reduces the number of carrier animals you come coming into the next season. So it ends up kind of protecting you right through to the sale of those trade um, steers and heifers. So um, here we have some pictures showing the stages of pink eye over the um, sort of well, two to eight week period, depending on whether they receive treatment. The early you can treat affected animals, the better. Um, when you first notice the weeping eye or the ulcer, that's when to get in with your um, orbenin, the antibacterial eye ointment. Um, you have to get that antibacterial eye ointment from a, from a vet, uh, and they may also um, advise that you use pain relief, which is a great option. Um, if the process has been missed, it'll go on to develop a, a nastier um, melting uh, ulcer, and these stages may need um, systemic antibiotics as well as your um, topical treatment and most likely a patch to cover that eye and reduce the stress on stress on the eye and the sun to the eye. Um, later stages, like these animals will um, have significant weight loss over the period of time that they're affected like this. If they have a non-healing ulcer, it can go on for months. Um, so yeah, the, the best got in and treated and, and got better as soon as you find them. Um, this last one, sometimes people may not even notice until they get right through this to this scarred stage. And obviously, once they're at the, the scar stage, even though the buyers don't like them, they are actually, um, and they may be carrier animals, but the actual um, disease process in the, in the eye has passed. Um, oh, <laughs> just wasn't sure whether we'd end up having how much time that we'd end up having. We're pretty much at full time, but. Just need to quickly talk about worms. As a rule, we usually over drench our older cattle and under drench our younger cattle. So um, we need to drench our adult cattle less and our weaners much more. Um, calves will always require drenching at weaning and then usually require another drench to sort of mid to late winter uh, and again into the summer if we're keeping them right through. But beware, be very wary of withhold periods and um, especially going into, your, into the feeder markets, uh, particularly with the pour-ons. Um, there is, I just wanted to mention that there is a new product on the market, which is a dual active pour-on containing labamazole and moxidectin called platinum, which is a really um, great option if we, because we all should be starting to become wary of drench resistance because we've been relying on nectins for many, many years. We also have the trifecta, which is a triple drench option um, from Coopers. Um, I think, well, that's, that's pretty much a quick quiz through everything from me. I'll just end, oh, sorry. And stop showing the screen. And head back to you. Thanks. <clears throat> thanks, Alex, and, and thanks also, Jeff, for that overview. Um, we do have a few minutes now for questions. I'm, I'm not seeing um, many questions yet at this stage, but if you do have any questions for, for either myself or Alex or Jeff, please um, yeah, feel free to send them through through the chat box or through the question box. I think I did see one um, come through there around the, I think it was around the um, one of the apps, the drought, drought and supplementary feed calculator apps. Um, just trying to see what that question really was. It might have been more of a comment, I think. Um, so the comment was from, uh, was around there's a great app out there to um, if anyone's interested it's called the drought and supplementary feed calculator and it helps you to roughly determine how many grazing days your pasture has um, so yeah there are some great tools out there um, that particular calculator has been around for 
a little while now and and is available from the um from the app store which was developed by new south wales dpi um absolutely agree there are some really good tools out there that can help you get a better um a better or more accurate feel around um, animal intakes and then trying to juggle that that animal intake um and past your growth rate um i guess balancing act so thanks for that that comment um Okay, I think I've got one here for you, Alex. Is it okay to give the seven in one vax and Pilligard at the same time? Uh, yes, it is. Yeah. The, um, yeah, I suppose there has been occasionally some discussion about whether it, it, they're going to respond well to all vaccines at the same time. But um, we think about it in human medicine, we often multi vaccinate against many things. And yes, it's the best time to get it into them. So, yes, it is. Definitely. Okay. I just give it just um, not in exactly the same spot. And yeah, so um, two different spots on the neck or even either side of the neck. All right. Question. Thanks, Alex. Um, comment here or question, will the presentations be available for viewing later? Uh, they absolutely will be. What what will happen is um, you will receive an email about an hour after the the webinar with a, a link um, to be able to watch the the recording back. So um, that will certainly be there for you to to view. Um, so that's all good. Um, which another one for you, I think, Alex. Uh, which immunisations are okay with dung beetles? All immunisations, like so, vaccines are all okay with the dung beetles. It is some of the drenches which are not okay with the dung beetles, um, and some of those drenches do come in an injectable form. Uh, it is usually some of the mectins, but though some of the other mectins are okay. So usually if they're okay, they do like to advertise that. So yeah, I would say just a bit of research when you're buying your drench um, as to which are okay with the dung beetles and which are not. Okay. Um, another question, can, I, can we just revisit which paddocks we should target for grazing given the upcoming glut of pasture growth? So the um, the paddocks that I had, I guess that that list of that short list of um you know what sort of factors you might consider. The first one was around pasture quality. So targeting paddocks that have been previously well grazed this season are nice and open um, and and have high quality green material through them. We, we don't want paddocks that have a lot of sort of dead, poorer quality feed through them. If you're really trying to push livestock performance this spring and really trying to put um, you know weight on on young stock and also drive lactation so high quality pasture um, and and again if possible try and target paddocks that that may be that may have been let, let go last spring um, but but you've been able to then get back under some sort of control those paddocks would be um, preferred to try and put a bit of grazing management into this spring rather than letting them go go rank and, and get overgrown for a second year running um, just because of the ongoing effects that could have with with um, with legume composition um, and then the last two points there were just they were really the main ones and the other two were around um, you know maybe selecting paddocks that are a little bit wetter or lower line in the landscape paddocks you know that will hang on a bit longer through into spring um, and the last one was around bushfire risk as well, but that, that was sort of the main points that, that, that we covered. Um, a question for you, Alex. Did you say that seven in one covers pesty? Uh, yeah, no, actually, I had them both on the same screen, but it was kind of actually to make um, the point that uh, pesty virus is a separate vaccine to your seven in one. So, um, and also even that seven in one is just basically the five in one plus the two leptospirosis 
uh, components of the vaccine. So your seven in one, it doesn't sort of very clearly say, but it's basically your five in one plus protection against leptospirosis. But if you want to you know, have your cattle completely vaccinated, yet yeah, you need to use Pestivirus as a PestiGuard, which is a Pestivirus vaccine as a separate one. It does seem like it's an expensive vaccine, um, but essentially yeah, with cattle prices the way they are at the moment, it is essentially like um, an insurance. Pesty is another a topic where, yeah, we, I could really talk for a full hour, but um, the other thing is, it just if you're interested, just please <coughs> do um, give me a call. Because uh, the other thing is, you might just want to know the status of your herd, um, you, you know, whether they already have experienced the, the virus um, or whether you've had problems recently, and that just involves taking some blood samples from some of your cows and some of your heifer groups to see what your current immunity status is like. Yeah, two more, Alex. I can see here, and we've got we've got five minutes to go, so we'll, we'll see if we can sneak these last two questions in. Um, the first one: Can you spray or spread anything onto pastures to increase magnesium <laughs> as a grass true. as a grass technique preventative? That's Sue. Um, I was going to send you an email. Um, it could be basically. I don't think so. I think the way that we think about. Um, yeah, that's why we always seem to focus it on getting it, trying to get it just into the animals themselves. Mm. The problem is it gets just tied up. It is it is so complex. They put research students, I mean, yeah, I would love to have a greater understanding of it, but um, I will certainly send you through the resources that I've got. I think we just had a, I think it was more that the magnesium that was there was just tied up in the soil and wouldn't move through into the plants and that was what was so much more tricky about it. Mm. Um, the next question. Uh, and the last one from Carl Wooler. Do you have a perspective on fluke poron versus injectable solutions? Uh, yes, I do. Um, so, yeah, uh, orals are meant to be better, but I don't know, when they end up spitting so much onto the ground, um, I, I do, the, uh, yeah, I didn't talk about fluke because, again, it was just about trying to fit things into a 15-minute slot. But... Um, uh, I think with fluke, we've got to think about um, resistance and rotation of our chemicals. And some of the porons um, get better blood levels than others. Um, and some of the porons don't get very good blood, blood levels. So it's about making sure that we use a good, a good product. Yeah. Um, I, I do like to try to rotate. I personally try to rotate to using an oral drench with, when I'm using triclobendazole. Um, I think you get better levels, but um, I, I will also use the um, injectable, like rotate to different chemicals at different times of the year. Use um, uh, like I've met with Corsulon at, at the winter stage as well. All right. Thanks, Alex. And yes, yeah, some really good advice there. All right. Well, I think that was the, the end of the question. So, um, yeah, I'd just like to thank everyone um, for tuning in today and and for your attendance. And yeah, big thank you to Alex and Jeff for sharing their their wisdom. Um, uh, very much appreciated. Um, when you click out of this webinar, when it comes to a close, um, you'll notice that there is a very short. I think it's a two question survey. So we're just really keen to um, get you to just provide an overall rating of, of, of today's webinar. Um, and also, if you think there's anything specific that we missed today, or just some, some other general comments, there is a second uh, question there around that as well. So thanks again, one and all, and um, enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank you. Thanks, Brad. Thanks, Jeff.